of the things that Scott mentioned in his talk is something they're trying, I, I think, in the D.C. area of Virginia, the, instead of the HOV, high occupancy vehicles, the HOT lanes. Yes. And are we looking at that where it's, it's high occupancy and tolls? Yes. So um, how does that work? Uh, most places are taking a HOV lane, high occupancy vehicle lane, and then converting them to a high, high, high occupancy toll tolling, which means that you can opt in, it's for a H, you know, HOV, a multi-passenger uh, vehicle, but you can opt in by paying a toll to use that lane. So if I'm a, if I'm a single driver in a, a vehicle, I can pay extra and, and get access to the HOV lane? That's the, that's the concept. So, and is that done wirelessly? Or do I, how do I, how's I, do I pay for that? How am I yeah, building? Mo most modern toll stuff, and particularly high applications, are, are using a toll tag of some sort, so it's electronic uh, payment. And a lot of them, you know, some of the examples around the country, like in uh, San Diego and places like that, they're a, a variable, they're variable pricing as well based on congestion level. So the more congested, the higher the price is. So, so the, if the, the, the rich get there sooner. In a, in a better style. That, that's been one of the criticisms of the concept. Uh, you referred to derogatorily someone as a Lexus lean uh -huh. kind of a concept. Right. Uh, but I, there's been times when I was running late for an airplane, I would have paid anything to, uh, well, to get there sooner. Yeah, I mean, it's used in a lot of other industries, you know, pricing. Oh, well, the airline industry. As a way to manage yep. demand. I mean, it happens in airline and, and that sort of thing. So it's. it's uh, but those social equity issues do come up. Yes. So one of the things I've been writing about is electric vehicles, smart grid, and, and plugging those in into, into the ITS systems. Uh, and you know, eventually when the systems build out and you have smart buildings and smart garages and people will be queued when the, the most opportune time is to get in the car and which routes to take and those kinds of things. Obviously, this integrated system takes years or decades to build. What's your vision? How long is it going to take, and what kinds of milestones would you expect us to see over the next 10 and 20 years? That's a, that's a very good question. Predicting the future is an incredibly difficult thing, because I look back at, you know, it was over 10 years ago we demonstrated some of what um, one of the uh, programs Federal programs demonstrated autonomous vehicle operation on, on California freeways, and you know, so technologically you can get there, but you know, all the other pieces that have to come together, the market forces that really make some of this stuff become viable, it's really hard to predict when that will happen. So, um, I think we'll continue to see um, improvements in that kind of integration. Um, one of the session themes here at this conference was really looking at um, the data side of ITS, and I think we're my view, we're on the verge of a very big data explosion because more and more data is available about the system. And so harnessing that data, figuring out what to do with it, using it in ways we haven't maybe even thought of yet, but part of that is integrating um, with the vehicle, with the driver in, in ways that, that can help them make decisions about the travel and, and improve the way the system operates for all of us. Yeah, certainly uh, with smartphones and I, iPhones and, and uh, Google Transit and information that it's going to be available will be distributed and with uh, platforms like Twitter for instantaneous short messaging to share those kinds of information. I think there'll be bottoms up, which can move much quicker than the big top-down government, uh, sy big system stuff, yeah. uh, that we'll see a lot of that develop. Uh, yeah, I think a very good point. I think there's, you know, the role of the public sector and private sector, we'll see those roles continue to evolve. Um, I know already our intentional strategy is taking the data that we have available and we're, we're making available through our travel information, but we're making it available as a XML data stream for those kinds of purposes. So the private sector can intercept that and maybe they've got a creative idea, iPhone app, uh, integration into an in-vehicle navigation system, places that the DOT would necessarily uh, reach on its own. So I think there's an idea there to embrace that private uh, investment to take this data, work with us, develop other kinds of applications that will really help this kind of reach the end, end goal. Yep, and also certainly the vehicle manufacturers, and it's just not the EVs coming along. Ford's introduced, uh, I forget what they term it, but smart dashboard and hooking up to the cell phone and Bluetooth.
Yeah. I think Scott pointed out in his talk about part of the problem is distracted drivers. So now we have the cell phone ban currently in Oregon and other states that you know people are death on texting, which they should be mm -hmm. when people are driving. But there's got to be some ways of having better communications between the drivers and the highway system and then driver to driver or vehicle to vehicle. And I think that's going to be an interesting human factors way of controlling information, filtering it, so you get what you need and can interact without being distracted from what's actually happening in front of you. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of human factors work to be done to try to determine how to do that effectively without, you know, creating these driver distra distraction problems and without creating a, a car that's like a, you know, fire jet cockpit and so complicated that the average driver is not going to be able to master it. So there's a, there's a big human factors effort there to take all this information, process it, putting it in forms that are easy to understand, quick to understand. And, and don't lead to um, the problems we see with driver distraction. Exactly. In fact, the, the DOD has been funding uh, something called the pilot's assistant that helps sort out you know, the controlling of the aircraft, all the firepower, and also bad guys and bandits around it to sort through that because when you're flying at the you know, Mach Plus and have uh, all those weapons and uh, high-powered F-22 under your saddle, it's it's a lot going on there. Yeah, not a lot of time to think either. Things no, and, fast. and the, how do you differentiate the load, share the load of what's going on between the machinery and the communication system and the driver or the pilot is a real intriguing problem. Yes. So definitely cars are getting smarter, but there's still a lot for the drivers to do. And there is no substitute for paying attention. Exactly. Um, so at this conference, it's been, I've been impressed with the, the number of people. They're saying 350, 400 people attended. Is that one of the most successful uh, NWT conferences that you've had? Um, I think the numbers are up from the last two years ago, but about equal to where the conference has mm -hmm. been you know, a few years back. So, uh, but still a very strong attendance, a good mm -hmm. turnout for the, for the meeting this year. So uh, where's the conference going to be next year? Uh, the Northwest Transportation Conference is held every two years, and it's uh, traditionally always here at uh, OSU. So I think we'll be back here two years from now. All right. Well, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be at the next one, uh, I guess not next year, the year after. And uh, I'd like to come up and see some of your operation and get a look at how many servers you say you're running now? Uh, we're around 65 servers now running all the ITS. 65? Yes. That's a lot. And there's nothing more fun than watching servers. Oh, thrilling. <laughs> uh, Galen, thank you for uh, chatting with us. We appreciate it. Very well.